It's a true honor to be with you all tonight. Thank you for coming out. We're on our national North American tour, if you count uh, a stop in, in Eastern British Columbia and Toronto at the end of the month. So uh, we are uh, racing around the country. A few people, very uh, perspicacious readers of our schedule, have pointed out that uh, it appears that we are in Seattle on Wednesday, New York on Friday, and, and Olympia on Saturday. Uh, <laughs> And there's only one person to blame. I'm, I'm largely responsible for the tour, but uh, we, we had kind of figured out that, that you know, Town Hall was a must stop in Seattle. Uh, and I had envisioned a Friday night stop, but it was uh, because I planned this tour shockingly late in the spring for this uh, schedule, uh, it wasn't available. But we made it here tonight to be with all of you. So thanks again to Town Hall for accommodating. <laughs> And as always, to all of the non-commercial broadcasters that carry democracy now and have for so many years, KBCS Radio. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there's just so many to mention. Seattle Community Media has long carried the show on television here to cable subscribers in the city. This flyer has a vast list of, of uh, Washington stations that carry uh, the show, and uh, we'll, be good. we'll be heading down, as I said, to Olympia for a great joint event Saturday with Chaos, my favorite call letters, Chaos Community Radio out of Evergreen, and KOWA, uh, LPFM, and uh, Thurston Community Television, and, and it's just uh, to begin the, our, our, our dash down the West Coast. Uh, we are, um, like I said, doing benefits for stations primarily. Tonight is a, is a more traditional town hall event, and so uh, your proceeds and a portion of them go to support uh, town hall. Today, I'm, I know, I've learned, and I've been learning throughout the day, is Give Big Seattle Day. Uh, obviously, typically, there's an admonition against uh, fingering your cell phone during uh, an event like this, but uh, because hours are short in Give Big Seattle Day, if you feel compelled, to give to Town Hall, a nonprofit, or KBCS, then break out your phone and, 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 and do so, because I know uh, Town Hall had a goal, I don't know how big the goal was, they were $3,000 short of the goal not long ago, uh, and there's still hours to go before the end of the day. So uh, give big Seattle. I know it's a really, uh, it's a very generous community, and uh, I know you can do it. So thanks again. The, um, the flyer, which has all our stations, I have to say, is it, it's lacking um, what we see more and more with democracy now, which is carriage on our, our storied and threatened uh, PBS stations around the country. Uh, so it's uh, every day you know, we put democracy now up on a, on a whole slew of satellites, and we send it via fiber, hither and yon, and it goes out on the internet. So it is uh, twice a day on the PBS satellite, so a station can, can download the show and carry it live or, or record it for subsequent playback uh, with a mouse click. So if, uh, if there's anyone here from KCTS 9, I'm happy to talk to you after about how to do that. But uh, as members of the public, we have a responsibility not only to protect our public broadcasting system, that is, you know, it's perennially under threat uh, but now more than ever, it's, uh, you know, it's, I have to say, I was uh, just had a birthday the other day, and one of the things you learn about Amy at these talks is it's not just the news uh, journalist that you see or hear on the show, but she has a, a really great sense of humor. Uh, and she's also, another detail about her personally, seemingly obsessed with recognizing people's birthdays. Uh, and so. She did that last week for me. I turned some vague something, 50-something. Uh, but it, my age puts me in that, that age where I was five when Sesame Street was launched. And it you know, certainly had a great impact on me growing up. And to imagine that uh, it would be, the whole budget of CPB would be sacrificed so that uh, Donald Trump could launch 59 Scuds into a desert um, is, is pretty, it's, it's upsetting and it can be stopped when there is collective action and I think uh, Seattle is a, is a source of that. 
Because Seattle plays such an important role in my own personal connection to Democracy Now!, I'm just going to indulge for a few minutes uh, in my connection to the show, which has been so uh, formative in my own life. Uh, I was, uh, in 1996, I was uh, employed as the caretaker of a small island off the coast of Maine. I had no, I had, I had a handheld electronic device, but it was a, a marine VHF radio to communicate with some of the other islands and the lobster, uh, lobstermen. But it was uh, a very, you know, it was actually the island owned by the family of Buckminster Fuller, so it had kind of an interesting, uh, uh, some, some artifacts of his impressive life. He was no longer living at the time, but uh, as ISIL, I actually commuted with a sea kayak. It was six miles to shore for groceries. And uh, three miles farther out, there was a, an island with a, with a payphone. If I needed to call someone, <laughs> I would go out to an island, uh, North Haven, if you know Penobscot Bay. But anyway, it was an isolated uh, existence. And I had a radio, and I actually had the benefit of uh, community radio WERU out of Blue Hill, which is one of the nine stations that first carried Democracy Now! So in that state of, of blissful isolation, uh, while people here were in, you know, creating Web 0.5 or whatever was happening out here then, uh, I was uh, you know, listening to Democracy Now! and it was a very vital connection. And I think it inspired me, like it does so many, to get more involved. Uh, jump ahead to 1999, and I had a, a, a small role as part of the groups organizing to contest the uh, corporate globalization program of the Clinton administration, and primarily in the streets here of Seattle. And I know there are many of you here who were in the streets on that week uh, blocking the meeting. Uh, but the uh, at, there was an action camp in September before the, night, the November, December protests that I was at. About a, you know, 100 or 200 people were planning the blockades and the shutdowns, and it was like there was all these great activists, and they were forming working groups like the, the blockade working group and the, you know, the kind of the forest defender labor, you know, collaborations and people coming downtown to scout out how to block the delegates from getting to the meeting. And, and uh, there was a, 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 a working group that no one wanted to join. So uh, just favoring the underdog, I joined it. It was the mainstream media outreach working group. <laughs> and the point was, uh, we knew that the mainstream media was going to cover the protests. They were going to do a horrible job, most likely. But we don't want to be guilty of, of, of you know, furthering their end by not trying to give them the true story of why people were in the streets. So we did press conferences, we gave press statements, we gave them experts about the issue of why people were opposing the WTO. Uh, and largely they did fail, and many of you remember the press coverage. It was dismal. Um, in, it was here that I first met Amy Goodman, Juan Gonzalez, Jeremy Scahill, the small team that formed Democracy Now! They broadcast that week, just a block, a block from here, they produced their live show from the Plymouth Congregational Church. Uh, and I was with a working group I mentioned down at the Indy Media Center. I can't remember, third or fourth street? It was third street, thank you. It's all a blur. But the uh, Indy Media Center was a great hub of, of this kind of pioneering uh, civil citizen journalism. and. Uh, the IndieMedia.org website that was thrown up for, for the purpose of covering the WTO protest got more traffic, more hits than CNN.com did. And that's, you know, by 1999 standards, that was pretty good showing for a brand new website. And it really gave uh, an, a, a impulse to the, the growing awareness that the internet was going to create opportunities for a leveling of, of the media playing field and for organizing as well. So uh, while we were down at the IMC, as it was called, at night, uh, you know, as the police riot was unfolding and ongoing, uh, you know, it got to be dark and these sodium vapor lights are illuminating the street and there were literally clouds of tear gas and flashbang grenades. Uh, we were, had to literally barricade ourselves in. The, 
big group of riot police came charging the door, and a few of us managed to keep the door shut. Uh, they, I mean, hulking, fully equipped riot police. They forced the door open a few inches and shoved in a hose. And I'd never seen this delivery mechanism. It was a pepper spray hose, like, like, hot, like a, a fire hose strength stream of pepper spray came in. And uh, despite that, you know, these, uh, it wasn't necessarily new to some of the, like the forest defenders that were there doing security for the IMC. So we kept the door shut and recovered, and then looking out in the midst of the mayhem, and there was a small figure following the riot police very closely with an arm upraised. And that was my first time seeing Amy Goodman in the field reporting. Uh, so anyway, she was you know, in, the, in the tear gas clouds without a gas mask, obviously the, the, the police riot that was happening, they were all equipped with gas masks. And she withstood that and did some great reporting. And, uh, and that was the distinction, I think, that really clarified for me the, the importance of independent media. Uh, I had an uh, opportunity to support the, uh, the uh, Appeal for executive clemency for Leonard Peltier back in 1999-2000. Uh, organized a march in New York City for him, and, and you know it's interesting to see we're all talking. People are kind of all upset about the FBI. If you follow the, the you know the Leonard Peltier story through, it's now more than four decades. You know that the FBI is uh, is not always on the up and up, but. Uh, and in fact, the, the march that I helped organize in New York was the largest ever held for Leonard. It was on Human Rights Day 2000, intended to influence Bill Clinton to grant him executive clemency. We all know Clinton abused his power of executive clemency. But the um, FBI held a countermarch two days later in front of the White House. And, and uh, Peltier is one of his lawyers, Bruce Ellison, who's been just a you know, active in the Wounded Knee Defense, Lefe Defense Offense Committee, uh, Legal Defense Committee in the, during the uh, Wounded Knee occupation. Uh, and just recently we saw him as a fully active defense attorney for the water protectors up at Standing Rock. Bruce Ellison said of that FBI march two days after the, the Peltier march, it's the first armed march in front of the White House since 1814. And uh, we all know what happened then, right? No, the, the Brits burned down the building and the Madisons left. Anyway, the, uh, that experience with Peltier, you know, it was so, uh, you know, so much went into the clemency uh, campaign and having failed to succeed to secure clemency, the folks who were running his campaign in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, which was the, the, the most livable town near uh, Leavenworth, Kansas, where he was imprisoned at the time, uh, needed a break. So I went out there for six months to kind of help keep the lights on and help keep the office going and, and figure out next steps for the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. And in that role, I spoke to Leonard every day on the phone and visited him weekly in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. But on those phone calls that we had, uh, he would get a moment on the phone in between a so-called recreation period in the yard and, be, and then going off to be forced to work in the prison labor industry. Uh, but in that brief moment, he would call and we'd talk about you know, what, were, what the work of the committee was going to be that day. But he would open these calls every morning with a question, did you hear Amy this morning? <laughs> and that's because Community Radio KKFI, a 100,000 watt station like KBCS here, serving the community in Kansas City, reached the prison yard. And although the war warden of Leavenworth had, had minimized or had, had uh, reduced the size of the radio that the prisoners were allowed to have. They had a very small transistor radio and Leonard told me that, oh yeah, he and the brothers gather around the radio in the yard in the morning and listen to Democracy Now! And so it's just a, I think, it's an image worth considering to have these, you know, you know mostly huge federal prisoners hunched around a small radio in a concrete yard intently listening to this news program. And it's because it is, like me on my island, such 
a vital connection to the wider world and to the happenings and relevant news. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the campaign to free Peltier continues, uh, and he still persists in, in very dire circumstances, but he is living and fighting to this day. I, uh, I moved on from there to help Democracy Now! in different capacities and have continued to this day, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, the uh, couple years ago, we got a call from an administrator of prisons in the United Kingdom. Uh, and this, this Brit said, uh, you know, I run a bunch of educational programs in a series of prisons. Uh, we have a closed circuit TV system, and I'd love to run Democracy Now! on, on our prisons TV system. And we're like, and he wanted permission. And we're like, by all means, you can take it and <laughs> run it all you want. So we did. And a year later, he contacted us and said, uh, you know, we've, we've seen a 50% increase in the participation in our classroom and, you know, our different educational offerings that we, we have for the prisoners. And we've asked them, why did you decide to take this class or this uh, access, this educational opportunity? And he said almost to a one, they say, well, it's because of something I heard or saw on Democracy Now! Uh, so again, since, since I'm in a room with, you know, inventors and innovators of the digital space and the internet, you know, there are people out there in this country, sadly, more than two million, who have, you know, very limited resources or access to the same information that we have. And, you know, I'm very inspired by the work of all the you know, community media, radio, TV stations that, that provide the service, not only to all of us, but to those who uh, you know, can't access information as easily, the prisoners, people on the other side of the digital divide. Uh, and so when you're supporting KBCS, for example, on Seattle, uh, Give Big Seattle Day, uh, you're doing it not only for the value, I think, for, that it brings to you all, but also to those uh, who are perhaps most in need. Um, you know, we had a great uh, team at Democracy Now! and Amy will talk more about it. Uh, we were out last Labor Day weekend covering the resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline and documented uh, private security guards uh, unleashing dogs on nonviolent, mostly Native American water protectors. Uh, the guards were not only unleashing dogs, they were physically assaulting. Uh, you know, men, women, and children. Uh, they were, their dogs were attacking horses, these incredible, uh, you know, young indigenous horse riders who ride bareback, and uh, the dogs were attacking them. Pepper spray, the usual array of so-called less than lethal armaments. We documented all that and immediately turned around a very quick uh, seven-minute video report that went viral. Uh, you know, at least 14 million people viewed it, according to some metrics, on the internet within a day or two. Uh, and I think it really had an impact on, on the public awareness of what was happening in that very distant, uh, that conflict. Uh, that report uh, was just last week recognized with uh, something called the Society for Professional Journalists. Sigma Delta Chi Award uh, for 2016. It's a very prestigious award uh, from a, it's highly respected, and it was uh, for the category of breaking television news. And, you know, I think it's a wonderful tribute to Amy and the team that did the work and that supported the work, but it's also an indicator that where we are. The previous five years that we looked at had all been, that award for breaking news had all been given to CBS Evening News, ABC World News Tonight, and the NBC Nightly News. So these are media institutions uh, that have essentially unlimited resources at their disposal and, and licenses to print money, certainly during the, uh, during the um, election season when they sell political ads with dark money. So these, these are very well-resourced institutions, and, and they do cover news, and they cover the breaking news with a, you know, an army of helicopters and, and so on. So for a small and, and still small, scrappy news organization like Democracy Now! to 
to produce breaking news the way we did that weekend and to get the recognition from the Society of Professional Journalists. It's, a, it's an indicator that the digital media world that was opened up, frankly, on the streets of Seattle in 1999 has matured and it is, you know, it's a truly uh, wonderful moment to be in this type of news production. Uh, none of this would happen, uh, you know, I guess, I can't remember his name, one of the founders of the European Union uh, said, nothing changes without individuals and nothing remains without institutions. And uh, democracy now is, I hope, a sustainably run, uh, well-supported institution, but it wouldn't be here without the individual who I'm about to bring out. Please join me in welcoming Amy Goodman. Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, my gosh. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, it is so wonderful to be here. To be back at Seattle Town Hall, and I'm thrilled that you're all out here supporting, yes, what I call the Sanctuary of Dissent, which I also call KBCS. Um, these, and Elliott Bay, these are places where we learn and are exposed to so many different ideas. I also want to thank the Glazer Progress Foundation, who has been with us for so many years, uh, to Maggie and Rob and the whole team um, that deeply believes in media uh, that is independent. And I thank them so much. And my dear friends, the Benjamin family, who is also here tonight, I'm so honored um, that all of you have come out. Uh, these are very serious times, and we need a media that is equally serious about providing a forum for dissent. Um, you know, I originally come from Pacifica Radio. Uh, Democracy Now! is an independent nonprofit now, but we came out of Pacifica, which was founded oh, almost 70 years ago in Berkeley, California, uh, by a war resistor named Lou Hill. When he came out of the detention camps after the war, <coughs> I still have this little cough from 1999, the Battle of Seattle. <laughs> Has anyone tested this water? I just want to know, just, it's okay. <laughs> um, the thing is, when Dennis was describing covering the police officers, I, they had their backs to me. They were marching down uh, the street. I did not realize, I didn't even know how they were doing, because as I was walking, holding my microphone in the air, trying to record this, and I was also reporting for WBAI, I think it was just a stream of coughs. I don't even know how they kept me on the air. And I couldn't figure out how the police officers were not coughing, but they had their backs to me. When they turned around, I realized they all had gas masks on. Um, <clears throat> but, um, um, so, KPFA was the first Pacific station. It was born in 1949, founded by a man named Lou Hill, this war resistor, who said there's got to be a media outlet not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born. Not run by corporations is George Gerbner, the f late dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania would say. Not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And so Pacifica was born. The second station, KPFK in Los Angeles, 1959. Uh, the third station, my station in New York, WBAI, went on the air in 1960. Within its first year of operation, it was running a debate between James Baldwin and Malcolm X over the effectiveness of nonviolent civil disobedience, the lunch counter sit-ins. 
WPFW in Washington, D.C. Jazz and Justice Radio was born 40 years ago in 1977. Oh, and then there's the fifth station, really the fourth in order, KPFT in Houston, uh, born in 1970 in the spring. It's the only radio station in the country whose transmitter was blown off the air. That's right, right there in the Petro Metro of Houston. Um, they go on the air. A few weeks later, they're playing um, Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant. <laughs> and the clan blows the, the transmitter to smithereens. I, I thought it was a good song. But anyway, um, <laughs> so they get back on their feet. And a few weeks later, they rebuild the transmitter. And they go back on the air, and the Klan straps 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blows it up again. So now it takes months to get back on their feet. Um, uh, and then in January of 1971, they went back on the air, and they haven't gone off since. Um, Orlo Guthrie came into Houston to finish his song, Alice's Restaurant, on the air. <laughs> And I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops, because I often confuse their titles. <laughs> but he said it was his proudest act. And I think that's because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is, how dangerous independent media is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it is a Palestinian child, or an Israeli grandmother, whether it is a native elder of the Standing Rock Sioux or an uncle in Afghanistan, you begin to understand where they're coming from. Now, I didn't say that you will agree with them. How often do we even agree with our family members? But it makes it much less likely that you'll want to destroy them. I think that understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on Earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war, which is why we have to take the media back. And I think the mainstream media has been wrongly described. I don't think it represents the mainstream in this country. Because I really do think that those who are concerned about war and peace, those who are concerned about the growing inequality in this country, those who are concerned about health care for all, those who are concerned about climate change, the fate of the planet, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which again is why we have to take the media back. It is absolutely critical. It's the way we learn about the world if we don't know someone from another country or we don't ourselves come from another place. We learn about it through the media. And it's the way the rest of the world learns about us. It's a matter of national security. It's got to be through something other than a corporate lens. Why it's so important to support your public television, radio, community media, wherever you live. These are, I believe, uh, the forums of hope, the forums of understanding. And we have to grow them all over the country and link them up. So my brother David and I, a great journalist in Vermont, um, have written a few books together. The first was called The Exception to the Rulers. And the reason we called it that is in this high-tech digital age, we need a media that is the exception to the rulers. It's the motto of democracy now. All the media should call itself that. Then we wrote the book Static, and we called it that because even with high-definition television and digital radio, still all we get is static. That veil of distortions and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality, when what we need the media to give us is the dictionary definition of static, criticism, 
opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. So, you know, I think that Donald Trump becoming president has really helped the media find their backbone. Because he, well, he calls the media the enemy of the people. Um, this is extremely serious to undermine the media in this way. Um, because the media is essential to the functioning of a democratic society. There's a reason why our profession, journalism, is the only one explicitly protected by the US Constitution, because we're supposed to be the check and balance on power. Now, I even hesitate to say this out loud, but I really do think that if he stopped attacking the media so viciously, so frequently, every day, just for a few days, Sadly, the media would wrap itself around him, but he doesn't allow that to happen because he keeps punching out. Now, why do I say that? Well, because for so long, the media has shored up the establishment, and that is not our role. We don't occupy a comfortable position in society. It is not our job to be a party to the parties, but to be apart from them. So. Since Donald Trump has become president, and even before, as he attacks the media, you know, journalists attacking them by name, um, uh, viciously attacking media institutions, the media has started to sound a little like democracy now when it talks about the importance of independent media in a democratic society. That's true. And they've been doing quite well in that way, except when it comes to war. Um, when the White House, when the military bombs another country, and this is not just under the Trump administration, the media circles the wagons around the White House. And this is exactly when the media has to ask extremely serious questions. I mean, let's look back at the US invasion of Iraq 2003, six weeks before it was February 5th, 2003, when General Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, gave his push for war at the UN. You may remember that speech, the final nail in the coffin for so many. A speech he would later call a stain on his career. Um, and he said the evidence was in. I mean, he, was, he had a great deal of credibility because he was dragging his feet on war. But now he said, Yes, the evidence is in Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. So this group called FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, a media watchdog group in New York, looked at the four major nightly newscasts in the two weeks around that speech. This is a critical time. I just did a public interview with Noam Chomsky in Cambridge. It was a wonderful beginning of our tour. Um, Noam talks about the media manufacturing consent, sadly, manufacturing consent for war. Um, and that's what the media was doing then. That was a time, six weeks before the invasion, when half the country was for the war, half against the imminent attack. So, Fair looked at the four major nightly newscasts, NBC Nightly News, ABC World News Tonight, CBS Evening News, and the PBS NewsHour. There were 393 interviews done around war in that two-week period. Guess how many were with anti-war leaders? Zero is a major underestimate. Three. <laughs> Three of almost 400. That's no longer a mainstream media. That's a media beating the drums for war. Um, six weeks later, the US invaded Iraq. We need a media that tells the truth, that doesn't act as a conveyor belt for the lies of the administration. Uh, now, that was back in 2003. Here, the media has been critical. It has called out the lies of President Trump. But when it comes to bombing, I mean, when you had the US military bombing the Sy Syrian airfield, you know, the 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles made by Raytheon, not clear if 
President Trump was personally profiting because the last documents about his finances show he's invested in Raytheon. This is why it's so important we understand his finances, his tax returns, to understand his foreign policy conducted to further his own interests, not only about war, but for example, he just made a call to President Erdogan of Turkey after he pushed through a referendum that would increase his dictatorial powers. He's just arrested tens of thousands of people in Turkey, not to mention how many have been killed. Uh, European countries condemning this referendum that would allow him to stay in power for many more years. And President Trump calls him to congratulate him on his victory in this referendum. Is it because there are twin Trump towers in Istanbul? We need to know this. It is absolutely critical because this endangers our national security. We have to decide together what that foreign policy will be. Um, so when Syria bombed the airfield, when the U.S. bombed the airfield in Syria, it's not as if the U.S. isn't bombing Syria before and after that day. Um, scores of civilians have been killed, hundreds as a result of those bombings. But it was the first time the U.S. bombed a Syrian military and the Syrian government. Um, that's when the media stepped back from being critical and started to talk about Donald Trump became presidential that day. And then you had the dropping of the Moab in Afghanistan. That's the mother of all bombs, nicknamed that by the Pentagon. The massive ordnance air blast, that's blast radius is something like a mile. He drops this bomb. It was developed under President Bush. He didn't dare drop it. President Obama didn't dare drop it. And within a few months of his presidency, Donald Trump drops the largest non-nuclear bomb in the world that was ever dropped. And then you had the Yemen raid a few days after he was inaugurated that killed, I don't know how many children and women in Yemen and a U.S. Navy SEAL. And when that SEAL's body was brought back to Dover Air Base, Donald Trump went out there and so did the family. And the father of this Navy SEAL refused to meet Donald Trump, refused to shake his hand, absolutely outraged by what he had done, by the life he had taken. It is critical that we, ask, that we have a media that asks questions in all situations, under a Democratic administration, under a Republican administration. To come to Seattle is a wonderful experience for us. You know, we broadcast here every day. But um, when we started this tour a few weeks ago, we began in Denver. Oh, we were supporting the local community radio network, KGNU. We were supporting um, Free Speech TV, a satellite television network that's based there, as well as Denver Open Media, the public access station. There's Denver PBS. All these stations run Democracy Now! And it was thrilling to be there. Also, Colorado Independent, an independent website for Colorado News. And all of these news sites and uh, media outlets came together, and we had the event at the Su Teatro Performing Arts Center, a uh, local Latino community space. Um, and the next day, before we flew out to British Columbia, um, we went into the Unitarian Church because Jeanette Vizgueta had taken refuge there. She's a mother of four. Um, her oldest daughter is DACA. She's a dreamer. She's legally allowed to live, work, stay in this country. But Jeanette took refuge in the church in February because of what happened here in Washington to Danielle Ramirez. When she saw that a young person who was legally allowed to stay had been arrested by ICE, she thought, what chance do I have? <coughs> and so she went into the church. We interviewed her immediately by Skype from our TV studio. We were in New York. She was in Denver. But when we came to Denver for... Um, uh, for this big fundraiser, 
we wanted to meet her personally, and we filmed her and talked to her. It was Saturday morning, uh, her kids were just waking up. Her little daughter, Zuri, is six years old, and her boy, Roberto, is 10 years old, a wisp, a feather of a boy. Speaks perfect English, goes to the Denver Public Schools, and Zuri and uh, Roberto were going to march in a Cesar Chavez march that day. Um, as I was talking to Jeanette, she told me that they had gotten a lot of death threats, the family, and she was very concerned. I said, well, what gives you hope? You've been here for two months now. And she said, oh, because so many more people express their support. She had thousands of people all over the world. It reminded me of Isabel Allende, the great writer, House of the Spirits, who said, for every thug, every paramilitary killer that's out there, she said, there are thousands of compañeras and compañeros who are there to support you. And that's what Jeanette was voicing that day. Um, she said, don't think I just sit here and people help me. She said, I work for immigrants' rights from morning until night. Oh, she said, as for the death threats, the Denver police chief had come to her and said, I've got your back. You call me if there's any problem. Oh, the Denver mayor said the same thing. And the local congressman, Jared Polis, also said this. It's really astonishing what's happening in this country, the level of resistance at every level. So Roberto and Zudi come out. Zudi climbs on her mother's lap, and Roberto comes out with this poster that his teacher had made that they are making copies of a beautiful lithograph of the face of Jeanette, where they're very distinguished Mayan features. And on the bottom it says, keep families together. And they were going to hold this poster that day in their march. And as I interviewed Roberto, he always had his arm around his mother and he was holding the poster. And he said, we're going to go out marching today, but my mother cannot come with me because she could be arrested. She said, he said, I am my mother's voice. So we went back to New York and we broadcast this interview. You can check it out at democracynow.org. Uh, the next day, a Time magazine announced its 100 most important people in the world, I think it is. Jeanette Vizgata was among them. And <laughs> she, so she held a news conference. Of course, all the media had to come to her. And she held up her 2016 tax return. She said, I will show you mine, and I also would like the President of the United States to show you his. She's lived in this country for over 20 years, like so many undocumented immigrants, has worked hard, has paid taxes, is law-abiding. Um, and in a few days later, Mo was like two Tuesdays ago, Time Magazine held their big gala for the most important 100 people in the world. You might have heard about um, John Legend being there. All the glitterati were there. He had some choice words for the president. That video went viral. And Jeanette, of course, couldn't come to New York because she was afraid of being iced, arrested by ICE. So, the community had the time gala in the church for her, and they had a big party that Tuesday night. And we showed the pictures on Democracy Now! Wednesday morning, Arturo Hernandez Garcia was arrested by ICE on the streets of Denver. Now, I know Arturo because two years before, in 2015, he took refuge in the Unitarian Church. A father of two, married in Denver, has worked for more than a decade with his brother-in-law in a tile business. This was under the Obama administration. I mean. President Obama called, even by his closest immigrants' rights allies, those who worked in the White House and outside, ultimately dubbed the deporter-in-chief. He deported millions of immigrants, um, more than any president in U.S. history, really laid a foundation for what we're seeing today. And Arturo went in at that time. He was really scared of being deported. And after a few months, uh, Obama's Department of Homeland Security did give him a document that said he was not a priority for deportation. Armed with that, Arturo felt he had an obligation to act in good faith and to come out of the church, and that's what he did. He said he wanted to give hope to immigrants, he wanted them to come out of the shadows, and so he continued working with his brother-in-law, and he has for several years now, until well, ICE couldn't take Jeanette, you know, she's gotten so much attention and she's inside the church. 
So they took Arturo the next morning when he was on his way to work. AFSC, which works with both of the American Friends Service Committee, we had Jennifer Piper on. And Jennifer called ICE, said, what are you doing? You know he has this document that says he's not a priority for deportation. And so the ICE representative on the phone said, this is a different era, and we have no priorities now. Very unusual way to put it. Um, and so Arturo has been taken. Um, then we were in Burlington, Vermont. And I was speaking at a Unitarian church there last week. And I look over. And there is Zuli Palacios and Kike Bakhasar. And they're two immigrants' rights activists, very well known. They work with a group called Migrant Justice in Burlington. And just a few weeks ago, ICE got them on the street, arrested them, and they were held for more than, well, close to two weeks, they were jailed. There was such a tremendous outcry. They're organizing the immigrants who work in the dairy farms of Vermont. There was such an outcry that they were ultimately released. So it was great to see them in the church. And I just have to ask, with Kike and with Zuli, with Arturo, with Danielle here, with Jeanette in Denver, is the Trump administration hunting down immigrants' rights activists? Karime Andahar is a well-known Rutgers student in New Jersey, and she started on Docu Rutgers and very well-known voice um, here under DACA, um, allowed to work and live and study here. She was called into ICE just the other day. Everyone thought she would be taken. Um, Senator Booker, many other high-level officials came out on her behalf. We had her on Democracy Now! If you listen this week, Juan Gonzalez interviewed her co-host on Democracy Now! And she went into ICE on, uh, for a, um, for, because they said she had to. And ultimately, she was not taken. She was released. Is the administration hunting down immigrants' rights activists, sending a message? Because for each person who's taken in, whether they're deported or not, it sends a message that chill through communities of millions. You don't even know if the person ended up being deported. It is just that message. And it's absolutely critical that media provides a forum, not just to tell their stories, as I'm telling you tonight, but for them to speak for themselves. That's a media that serves a democratic society. So I mentioned Juan. I wish he was here with me tonight. Um, we started Democracy Now! together 21 years ago. And last... Um, last year, in fact, when we were going through the book tour last year, when the hardcover of Democracy Now! came out, uh, Juan had just announced his retirement from the New York Daily News. He had been there for 29 years, one of the great journalists of this country as a columnist. He started in Philadelphia, then came to New York. And so during the tour that I was on around the country, I get, kept getting these pictures on my cell phone when I'd be talking. Uh, yet another retirement party for Juan. The New York Daily News threw him one in at the Francis Tavern, this historic tavern downtown Manhattan. Um, and I'm getting these pictures of, oh, Governor Cuomo just walked in, Mayor de Blasio just walked out. You know, they won't be together because they hate each other. But, you know, one walked in, one walked out, Senator Schumer is there. I'm going, wait a second, one. What did you do wrong? Why are all these politicians coming to fet you? But then I realized what they were doing is they had to come show up to see with their own eyes that this man who had dogged them for so long was finally leaving. But he was only, he was only leaving the Daily News. He stays with his other DN, Democracy Now!, and he's a professor at Rutgers University. But last year, he was also honored as the first Latino journalist um, in the New York Journalism Hall of Fame. And we all went to the ceremony in Midtown Manhattan, and that day, who was being inducted? Charlie Rose, Leslie Stahl, oh, New York Times' Max Frankel, a few other people, and Juan Gonzalez. And Juan's speech put them all to shame. 
This is a part of what he said as he talked about his quarter of a century as a columnist. He said, I figured my modest contribution would be not writing about outcast neighborhoods, but from them. Not simply to entertain, but to change, not after the fact, but before it, when coverage could still make a difference. He said, I've tried to use as many of my columns as possible to probe the injustices visited upon the powerless. Yes, the rich and famous are also victims on occasion. But they have so many politicians, lobbyists, lawyers, gossip columnists, and even editorial writers ready to jump to their defense that they'll always do fine without my help. I prefer the desperate unknown reader who comes to me because he or she has gone everywhere else and no one will listen. More often than not, I come across unexpected gems, human beings whose tragedies illuminate the landscape and whose courage hopefully inspires the reader to believe that there is indeed some greater good served by a free press than just chronicling or influencing the ouster of one group of politicians by another. Those are the words of Juan Gonzalez. So, I want to talk about our trip to Standing Rock uh, this past Labor Day. You know, it all began, well, it didn't just begin here, but we'll choose this as a marker, April 1st of last year, in the middle of the election season. Uh, native elder named LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, the unofficial historian of the Standing Rock Sioux in North Dakota, opened her property to the resistance. She has this beautiful property along the Cannonball River. The resistance? Well, it was the resistance to the $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline that would snake its way from North Dakota, taking the fracked oil from the Bakken oil fields to South Dakota, to Iowa, to Illinois, and then hook up with a pipeline to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the people of Bismarck, North Dakota, said they did not want this, well, the Native Americans call it the black snake. And this private corporation, the Dakota Access Pipeline, owned by Energy Transfer Partners, didn't put it there. And the people of Mandan, where the courthouse and the jail is, said, we don't want this um, pipeline. And so it wasn't placed there. The Native Americans said the same thing. This, we don't want it near the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. We don't want it tunneling under the Missouri River, the longest river in North America, and jeopardize the water supply of some 17 million people downstream, not just Native and not just our reservation, but they said for everyone. Well, their wishes were not honored. And so LaDonna Brave Bull Allard opens her property, and scores of people come, and then hundreds of people come. And then they have to open up more resistance camps, and there's the Red Warrior Camp and other camps, and soon thousands of people are coming to North Dakota. It was the largest unification of Native American tribes this country has seen in decades. Native Americans from Latin America, from the United States, First Nations from Canada, and their non-Native allies. So we went there Labor Day weekend. I mean, even that was late. Uh, we were covering it before, but we weren't on the ground. So we went there that weekend. My colleague, uh, Democracy Now! producer Laura Gottesdiener, um, our videographer John Hamilton, and our colleague Dennis Moynihan, who is an extremely humble person who co-wrote the book with me and David Goodman, Democracy Now!, 20 years covering the movements, changing America, who I write a column with every week um, for Hearst, for King Features, to kind of provide a roadmap into mainstream papers about where you can find um, other media. Um, this whole universe ide of ideas that I think represents mainstream America. So the four of us went to North Dakota. And it was right after a judge who was going to rule in the case the next week had asked the Standing Rock Sioux for a map. If they said that this was going to carve up their sacred ground, he wanted them to prove it, to show where their sacred burial grounds were. And they did. They made a map. And he gave it to the Dakota Access Pipeline. And he was going to rule the next week. So we were covering these protests. They, these protests are so deeply moving. They don't call themselves protesters. They call themselves water protectors. 
and you see hundreds of people walking these back prairie roads of North Dakota, they would often have a water ceremony before they began their walks. And they would have glasses set up uh, on the road. And then they would take these glasses as they walked, glasses of water, and they would be met by a fully militarized sheriff's department on the back roads of North Dakota, these defenseless, nonviolent, native women and men, elders, children, boys, girls, women and men, fully militarized sheriff's departments. They had NRAPs, they had tanks. How is this possible? And you know, I would see a native elder as they come against the kind of robocop uh, uniformed men, here, this is for you. We're doing this for your children as well as for ours, they would say. Now, you know what a militarized police department looks like, as Dennis described, 1999 here in Seattle, a kind of police riot, a police uprising, facing down tens of thousands of high schoolers, teachers, nurses, doctors, um, teamsters, environmentalists, who are all deeply concerned about the World Trade Organization in this largest export city in uh, the United States, deeply concerned that a supranational organization could overturn the laws of democratically elected legislatures, and they were expressing their concerns on the street. Uh, Norm Stamper was the police chief at the time. Ultimately, he was ousted, as I bet he thinks he should have been. Um, what happened there to hit people with so much tear gas and rubble bu rubber bullets. I mean, he is really the one who has described so eloquently what it is that happened. I mean, he's the person who is standing up now against this militarization, militarization of the police department. He described, he said, when we have this kind of military equipment, that's what we see. We see our neighbors as the enemy who's ever standing out there. You know it from Ferguson, um, Missouri. You know what happened a few years ago with the police killing of an 18-year-old African-American teenager who was about to go off to college, and he's gunned down in the street, and there is an uprising, and it's met by this fully militarized police department, and all the media did come there, and you saw that. I mean, in Seattle, um, the police department had to go to other states to get more gas. And in North Dakota, it was the same. This seems to be what recycling looks like in America today. You take the military hardware from Afghanistan and Iraq, and you outfit the police departments of this country with it. And it's unacceptable. And in North Dakota, And I really applaud Norm Stamper for now speaking out around the country for police reform. He knows what it means and what it did to his department. So back in North Dakota, um, we're covering these protests, and then on Saturday of Labor Day weekend, uh, we're covering a ceremony. Uh, the Native Americans were walking toward this area where they had designated on that map as their sacred ground. They didn't think the Dakota Access Pipeline was going to be excavating there. It was a holiday weekend. And then they saw the bulldozers operating at full tilt, and they were absolutely shocked. The site that they had designated and they believe that when the judge gave the map, because they have to give you know, to both sides, they gave their map to the other side, to the Dakota Access Pipeline, that they use this map, they leapfrog their bulldozers forward from where they were far down the road to destroy this area that they had designated so that when the judge ruled the next week, well, the facts would have already changed on the ground and it would be a moot point. And people were furious. And so, First, it was a woman and her child who comes up on the property, then more and more people, and they're demanding that the bulldozers pull back, and then hundreds of people are coming from the resistance camps, and they're moving up, and they're joining them, and they're telling the bulldozers to stop. And, I mean, the bravery 
at this moment. When you see a child, a woman, a man standing in front of these massive machines, it doesn't do it justice just to say bulldozer. <clears throat> and we're filming this, and it was a terrifying sight. I could only think back to March 16, 2003, three days before the US invaded Iraq, in another part of the Middle East, in Gaza, in Rafa, a young, college student from Evergreen College here in Washington State, Rachel Corey, went to Palestine to try in her own way to begin a process of peace between the Israelis and Palestinians and joined the international solidarity movement. She had befriended a pharmacist family, a Palestinian family in Rafa, and she saw <coughs> one day these Israeli military bulldozers coming and they were going to demolish his home. And she and other activists stood in front of their home, in front of the bulldozers, and she donned one of those orange neon construction vests. And she stood in front of his home, and the kids' home, the people that she had come to love. And this military bulldozer, made by Caterpillar in the United States, crushed her to death. And that's what I was thinking of when I saw these people standing in front of this bulldozer churning the earth. But this time they succeeded. And they stopped the bulldozers. And the bulldozers started pulling back one by one. One, two, three, four, five, six. They're pulling back along the road. There were so many hundreds of people moving forward. And it was then that the Dakota Access Pipeline guards unleashed attack dogs on the Native Americans attack dogs. And even the dogs were pulling back, and they would throw them into the crowd, and they would bite their way out. And we were filming. We filmed a dog with its mouth and nose dripping with blood. We filmed people who were bitten. And ultimately, despite all of this, the Native Americans stopped the company from building that day, and the guards and the bulldozers, the equipment pulled back. They retreated. We posted that video online on Facebook that night, and within 24 hours, there was something like 14 million views. And this really gives the lie to the mainstream media. This was the midst of the election year, okay? In the general election, you know, with the debates, uh, the journalists that moderate, I don't always call them journalists, I call them media personalities. But do you think one of them asked a question in these debates that millions of people were watching about climate change? This critical issue of our day that will determine the fate of the planet, even as this epic struggle was taking place in North Dakota, did anyone ask this question. Um, and you know, the media will say, well, they give the people what they want. People wouldn't be interested in this. Well, I think this shows that's not true. So we came back to New York. Um, we had to continue broadcasting Democracy Now! that week, and the judge was going to rule, I think, on Friday. On Thursday night, um, North Dakota Governor Jack Dalrymple called out the National Guard the decision was going to come down the next day. It did not look good for the tribe. Oh, and also the authorities, um, quietly, they didn't announce this, issued an arrest warrant for me. So I didn't know this at the time. And on Friday, um, the judge ruled about 5 o'clock. It was the Justice Department versus the Standing Rock Sioux. One other thing. President Obama was in Asia that week, this historic trip he made to Laos. And when he was in Laos, he held a democracy forum for young Asian students, and they came from all over. And one of the last questions was asked by a young Malaysian woman. And she raised her hand and said, President Obama, what about the Dakota Access Pipeline? <laughs> she asked a question that no American journalist had publicly asked President Obama. I mean, here she was coming to learn about democracy from the President of the United States. And, well, President Obama held forth eloquently on the oppression Native Americans have suffered for centuries. Um, 
And then he actually addressed this and said, I'd have to get back to my team on DAPL, on the Dakota Access Pipeline. So we came back to the United States that week, um, and reportedly, he saw the video of the dogs. The significance of this was not lost on the first African-American president of this country. I mean, we interviewed Winona LaDuke on the Day of the Dogs on that Saturday, the great indigenous rights activist from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota who pitched her teepee at the Red Warrior Camp, and it's designed with endangered species around the teepee. And she said, Governor Dalrymple, you are not George Wallace. This is not Alabama. It is not 1965. We are through. So on Friday, um, this judge ruled against the tribe. Um, the Obama's Justice Department had won. I guess the lawyers were about to pop their champagne corks, and it wasn't 15 minutes before an unprecedented joint three-agency letter from Justice, Interior, and the Army Corps of Engineers said, we're going to slow this down. So the Justice Department was really reversing itself. This clearly was orchestrated by the White House. They were going to slow down. They said they want native input. They want to see if there was an environmental impact statement that was done. They weren't going to move forward. I mean, the Native Americans were suffering from whiplash at this point. The worst decision that could have happened, and then 15 minutes later, they're told, oh, maybe you kind of won. So anyway, that day after Democracy Now!, we do the broadcast every morning at 8 Eastern time, uh, we flew to Canada. I mean, I wasn't fleeing. Uh, we just flew there. <laughs> because, um, uh, well, Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh and I were invited to the Toronto International Film Festival. They were premiering a film about the muckraking journalist I.F. Stone. Um, oh, and Matt Taibbi went of Rolling Stone, and we were going to speak after, um, uh, you know, I.F. Stone, who said to young people, if you're going to remember two words, remember governments lie. And he said, if you can remember three words, remember all governments lie. <laughs> Uh, and so that's the name of this documentary. And, and it also um, showcases Democracy Now! and Matt Taibbi, so that's why we're all up there. And the reason I went is I thought, wow, we were just in North Dakota. This is worth talking to people in Canada about. They care about First Nations. And the next day, we spoke at the University of Toronto. And in the middle of the talk, uh, I got a text on my phone, and it said, you're under arrest. Now, I... <laughs> So it was just like this, and I had to focus because I was speaking, and it was very hard to focus when I got this, and I didn't want to say, I mean, it said something like, there's an arrest warrant for you. Um, so I thought, oh, this must be some kind of scam, except that I saw it was a North Dakota number, and it turned out it was a North Dakota lawyer. So as I'm speaking, I'm thinking, okay, I have a problem here, because aside from thinking and speaking at the same time and not revealing what I had seen, because I understood that if there's an arrest warrant for you, you won't automatically be picked right up, but if you have any interaction with police or the FBI or perhaps with border agents and they see an arrest warrant in the system, you will be picked up. And the thing is, I was in Canada, and I had to get over the border. And I was thinking, could they possibly like, just not let me back into the United States? But, um, and I didn't want to make this public at the moment, and so I just said, could someone call me a cab? <laughs> and I went to the airport, and I came back into the United States, went back to New York, and I didn't take the arrest warrant personally. Um, I really felt it was a message that was sent to all journalists, do not come to North Dakota, which is exactly why we had to be there. And I also felt, for young independent journalists, it was... <laughs> for young independent journalists, it was really important. You know, if they want to go and cover something like this because they deeply care, um, they can't afford to get arrested, to go to jail, not to have any kind of institutional backing. And I wanted to show them, you don't have to get a record when you try to put things on the record, right? This is America. We should be able to do this. We value a free press, and so we have to stand up for it. 
So a few weeks later, we went back to North Dakota uh, to challenge the charges, to call the bluff of the prosecutors. It was completely ridiculous that they should have done this. And when we landed in Bismarck, North Dakota, um, the prosecutor announced they were going to drop the charges, <laughs> except that they were now going to bring new charges against me, charges of riot, for which I would face a year in jail. Uh, I mean, like... <laughs> Yeah, I'm a one-woman riot. <laughs> so anyway, I said to the, my North Dakota lawyer, not that I had one before, um, <laughs> I said, what does this mean? I mean, what's going to happen now? I mean, I'm here in North Dakota. There's now this arrest warrant. He said, well, no, there's not an arrest warrant. They've, they've now just... Um, uh, they vacated that arrest warrant, and now you're going to be arraigned on Monday at 1.30. So, oh, it's Friday afternoon, and at Monday at 1.30, oh, we can cover the protests all weekend. <laughs> um, but I said, so how does this work, though? It, there's just, it's just automatic. I'm just going to be arraigned in court. And he said, yeah. I said, there's nothing that happens in between. There's no person that intervenes. There's no, he said, no, I mean, there's a judge that, you know, signs off on this, but it's absolutely automatic. It's pro forma. He's going to sign off on all charges uh, over the weekend. And then you'll be arraigned, and that's where, in court and trial and everything, they'll use their discretion. I said, oh, no, 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 there's a person that has to make a decision this weekend. He said, yes, but it's not like that. It's really automatic. So I said, well, what's the judge's name? And so we issued a press release that said this judge was going to make a decision about whether these charges would be brought against me, uh, and, that would be and that would decide whether I would be arraigned at 1.30 on Monday. So we covered the protests through the weekend. And then, well, on Monday morning, the show must go on, and we had to broadcast Democracy Now! So we got a satellite truck from Minneapolis. You know, it's TV and radio, and it's now on over 1,400 public radio television stations around the United States and around the world. And Every day our headlines are translated into Spanish. Great way to learn Spanish, or if you speak Spanish, to learn English. You have the transcripts, you have the audio in Spanish and English, because it's run on Spanish radio stations around the world. Um, and uh, it's really critical that um, we uh, are able to uh, do this broadcast. So we bring in the satellite truck, and we decide to do it in Mandan, in front of the courthouse and the jail, so that uh, when the show ends, I could turn myself in. <laughs> so, okay, so there's the courthouse, there's the jail, and there's the Ten Commandments in between. Uh, we broadcast from a church property across the street, and this was our backdrop. And um, it was really an epic show. We interviewed um, Dave Archambault, the 45th tribal chair of the Standing Rock Sioux. He came over to... Mandan, an area he knew well because uh, he had been arrested and he was put in jail. I asked him about that. It was his only arrest. He was arrested a few months before protesting. Low-level civil disobedience to protect his tribe. 41st tribal, 45th tribal chair of the Standing Rock Sioux, like Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States. And he said, I said, what was it like to be arrested? He said, oh, I was, yeah, I was charged with a misdemeanor. I was strip searched, put in an orange jumpsuit, and I was jailed. We interviewed Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle. She's the pediatrician of the Standing Rock Reservation. She was one of the first to be arrested the summer of 2016 because she cares about the health of the children. She was strip searched. She was put in an orange jumpsuit and she was jailed. Um, and you multiply this hundreds of times. I mean, how much humiliation can a people take? You know, one of the times when I was at the airport, I was reading a magazine, and a guy came up to me, and he said, I know who you are. And I said, oh, well, who are you? And <laughs> he said, I'm one of the guards who was on the property that day, and I know who you are because I saw the video. Um, and I said, so did you unleash the dogs on the Native Americans? He said, no. You have to understand, he said, there were a couple of security uh, companies that the Dakota Access Pipeline employed, and we had no idea that one set of them. I mean, our report led to an investigation by the North Dakota Inspection Board, and they found this was an illegal use of dogs. They were not licensed, and they were from Ohio. But 
He said he didn't know they were going to unleash those dogs. He was horrified. And he said, you don't think I understand that when we sick attack dogs on them, when on top of massacres for hundreds of years, you don't think I get why they're angry? You know, you never assume how a person feels based on their position in life, and that's really important. And that's why we need an open media where people can discuss this and find their common ground. So we did the broadcast, and after the broadcast, um, there was a lot of pressure. It was building. Hundreds of Native Americans came to show solidarity. All of the media was now covering this. I mean, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Al Jazeera, it was the home page of BBC um, uh, internationally, Vogue magazine. <laughs> I have to spiff up my act, but... Um, and just before the 1.30 arraignment, I get a call from the host of North Dakota Public Radio, uh, who's been there for decades and knows everyone, who's anyone and even who aren't anyone. And he said, the judge is not going to sign off on the charges against you. Um, and it was not only that, it was that Native Americans who were going to court that day, which they were almost every day, uh, who faced felony and misdemeanor charges, a number of them also had their charges dropped. This just shows what happens when you shine the media spotlight in the right direction. I really do believe in reality TV, just not the kind that they have here in the United States, but to show the reality of people on the ground. Now, Wow, I, I, we just got this report from the Washington Post. Deputy Attorney General threatened to quit after being cast as impetus of Comey's firing, which was already decided, official says. I mean, it is so significant what's happening right now, what's happened in these last 24 hours. The idea that President Trump used as a rationale to fire FBI Director James Comey, Comey's treatment of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> he doesn't seem to understand the power of Memorex or videotape or film. I mean, I remember being on the Republican convention floor as Donald Trump spoke and those chants of jail her, jail her, the chilling feeling of this. Um, and the idea that we don't remember through the, this last summer how he applauded James Comey and now using this as the rationale uh, to say that this is why James Comey should have been fired. Sure, James Comey is not very popular among Democrats or Republicans, but we know what's transpired between this is that he spoke on March 20th, he testified before Congress, and he said he was investigating the Trump campaign and whether or not it colluded with the Russians to uh, somehow influence the 2016 elections. I mean, you have the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, who weighs in on this, makes this recommendation, when didn't he just say he was recusing himself from any investigation investigation that involved any kind of Russian collusion, we do have a memory. It is extremely important. And I want to say something else. Whatever happens here, we need a media that covers the movements. I mean, the resistance since President Trump has been inaugurated. You know, on Inauguration Day, um, Trump had something like 180,000 people in his inaugural crowd, which is a very respectable number, except when it was compared to President Obama's that was something like 1.8 million, about 90% larger. Um, 
And it was Trump who became obsessed with this. Soon he was saying he had the largest inaugural crowd of any president in history. But that even obscured the fact that just the day after, on January 21st, 2017, three times the crowd that came out for his inauguration the day before, led by women all over the country, uh, in New... <laughs> In Washington alone, something like five or 600,000 people. I saw um, uh, Kerry Washington, right, star of Scandal in Sundance. We cover the documentary track every year at Sundance. It was just a few days later. She was just exhilarated beside herself because she had been in Los Angeles and spoken to 750,000 people, millions of people. In Montpelier, Vermont, 20,000 people in the Capitol. The police closed down the interstate. They said the Capitol couldn't contain anyone else. Uh, Salt Lake City and Park City, and I don't know, I kind of think probably Seattle's was pretty big too. <laughs> Um, and then you move from that to Muslim ban one and two. Um, yes, and you know well, I mean, it's really going to be interesting to broadcast from here uh, in Seattle. Uh, you know well the role that your own so-called judge played. Um, your so-called federal judge that lives here in Seattle. Um, I mean, this is so interesting what happened, right? Executive order Muslim ban one bans refugees from seven Muslim majority countries. Um, and this spontaneous uprising around the country from Seattle airport to JFK to Dulles, I think a senator and a judge was roughed up by security. Thousands of people. And continually Donald Trump says, who is paying these people? We've got to get to. Now, you know, he is an expert in projection, and this is why he thinks people would come out, because at his own announcement that he was running for president in Trump Tower, he paid actors to be there to applaud. I bumped into, we did a five-hour broadcast on April 22nd, Earth Day, from the March for Science. Um, and then, which was freezing cold, freezing rain, and still thousands of people came out in Washington. One week later, April 29th, just the next Saturday, the hottest April 29th in Washington, D.C. history, I mean, it was like 97 degrees, close to 200,000 people came out for the People's Climate March. And one of the protesters came up to me and he said, um, I'm a paid protester, but I'm doing this pro bono. <laughs> but, I mean, the just outpouring of humanity around uh, the two Muslim bands, and I'm not calling it that, that's what Donald Trump called it. In fact, Donald Trump called it right until a judge just heard the case, they were debating it in oral arguments, and they said, it's on the Trump website today, so they took it off a few days ago. Um, and then, of course, the protests around tax day, show your taxes. We have never seen anything like this in this kind of concentrated way. And we need a media that goes to where the silence is. And you know what? It's not really silent there. Whether it's in North Dakota or whether it is in these protests. I mean, CNN got better. They started to actually cover protests, but you see them walking through the crowds and they'll say, we're making a right on 44th, we're going up 9th Avenue, then we're going down. I think, why don't you just hand the microphone to the people around you? You are marching among them Ask them why they're there. It's not enough just to show up, though that's pretty good. It's just one next step. And then you can do a five-hour broadcast that is made up of all these people's voices from all over the globe. But I just wanted to end by talking about what happened with the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
In December, December 5th, a second three agency letter was issued by the Obama administration, same agencies, Justice, Interior, and Army Corps of Engineers, and they basically said they were stopping it. It was either going to be redirected or somehow they would stop it altogether, which was an enormous victory for the Standing Rock Sioux. They would not grant the permit to tunnel under the Missouri River. And then Donald Trump became president, and in one of his first executive orders, he said he'd grant that permit for the final tunneling under the Missouri River, um, and they would revive the Keystone XL that people had beaten down years before. It wasn't President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton who killed that pipeline. It was the thousands and thousands of extremely persistent protesters. What, 1,200 got arrested like in one day, making a ring around the White House in the summer of 2011, among them Bill McKibben, the co-founder of 350.org, and the great Naomi Klein, author of This Changes Everything. And ultimately, they were forced to stop it. And it is the power of these movements. And yes, um, this is a powerful administration right now, a government that is trying to dismantle the state, the regulatory state. And I know that sounds kind of bureaucratic, but I'm talking about the land we live on, the air we breathe, the water we drink, that's what it means, uh, is in jeopardy when you dismantle the regulatory state. What we are seeing in Washington, to Washington, D.C., is the ascendancy of the oligarchy, right? You've got Rex Tillerson, former CEO of the largest oil corporation in the world, ExxonMobil, that did some of the best research on climate change. To their credit, they brought in the scientists, they did work, and then they covered it up for decades. And now, at the People's Climate March, I interviewed Maura Healy, the uh, Attorney General of Massachusetts, together with Eric Schneiderman, the Attorney General of New York, and before that, Kamala Harris, now Senator, but was Attorney General of California. They're suing ExxonMobil for covering up this critical information that will determine whether we survive here. And then you've got Scott Pruitt, the Attorney General, former of Oklahoma, hardly knew earthquakes, now it's the land of quakes from fracking, sued the EPA 14 times, and wants to eviscerate it as administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. <laughs> and then there is Governor Perry, Rick Perry, former governor of Texas, who ran for president twice, bankrolled to the tune of $6 million by Kelsey Warren, the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners, which owns the Dakota Access Pipeline. When Governor Perry stepped down as governor of Texas, he immediately went on the board of Energy Transfer Partners, only stepped down to become Secretary of Energy. These are very powerful forces. Now, the Dakota Access Pipeline says they will begin the flow of oil on May 14th. People at the People's Climate March, especially the Native Americans, like LaDonna Brave Ballard, who came to Washington, they were so proud that it had not happened yet. But they're doing it beyond one pipeline. They are now leading an international divestment campaign to disinvest from uh, banks like Wells Fargo, financial institutions like Bank of America, and others, um, because they're saying these are the financial chase as well, these are the financial institutions that are bankrolling DAPL. But it's not only the Dakota Access Pipeline. They are really shedding a spotlight on what underpins this fossil fuel economy in the United States. And I understand that it may well be tomorrow that the Chancellor of uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, um, comes out with a statement around divesting from a fossil fuel economy. The student movement in this country has been astounding and the pressure that they've brought. And these are the movements that it is critical we give voice to, we chronicle, and not only provide a forum for them to speak for themselves, but put them in dialogue and debate with the powers that be. Now, at the March for Science, as I wrap up, um, they had these amazing signs like, you know, there is no planet B, um, ice has no agenda, it just melts. Um, <clears throat> people held up signs that said, uh, I'm with her, and it was an arrow to Mother Earth. And a lot of 
people wore buttons that said science, not silence. And I wanted to end back where I began in World War II um, with a brother and sister named Hans and Sophie Scholl. Uh, who lived in Germany. They weren't Jewish, they were German Christians, but they thought, what can we do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? And together with their professor and other students and workers, they decided to form the White Rose Collective and to issue a series of pamphlets so that the Germans would never be able to say we didn't know. And they made six of these pamphlets, and they had distributed them everywhere in the middle of the night under cover of darkness. Um, one of them, written across, said, we will not be silent. And they distributed these everywhere, uh, in alleyways, in schoolyards, um, in marketplaces. And then Hans and Sophie and their professor, they were captured by the Nazis. They were charged, they were tried, they were convicted, and they were beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of the media today, should be the Hippocratic Oath of us all today. We will not be silent. Democracy now. Thank you.